flowing through the veins of God. A 5 gram mushroom trip report by a free lunch, taken from the Vivek Discord. My girlfriend and I live in an old jackrabbit cabin in the Mojave Desert. At the time, we had the place to ourselves and free of obligations for a couple days, so we decided to take psilocybin mushrooms together and watch the sunset. Our respective doses were each about 5 grams and we ate them simultaneously. We weren't expecting anything unusual, but were hoping for a spectacular sunset, as they often are out here in the middle of nowhere. I was primarily hoping to get a better look at the glistening strings which connect all the stars together, something I have always seen in the sky when I use psilocybin at night. I have a long-standing relationship with psilocybin mushrooms, which has never once been negative or upsetting, and I typically microdose, as I find it greatly improves my energy, mood, and ability to focus. I was not microdosing at any recent time before this experience, however. The mushrooms are of the Burma variety, grown and dubbed Myanmar Lightning by a dear friend who I learned much about amateur mycology with when we were roommates in another place and time. In my personal opinion, the effects of this very well-loved specimen are not quite like others I've tried before, but they definitely still fall within the realm of common mushroom trips for the most part. Maybe the passion with which he works feeds them in a way unknown to science, and after this experience, I wouldn't doubt it. Once the effects of the psilocybin had taken hold, and after rounding up some homemade herbal tea and blankets, we climbed to an elevated platform which stands about 12 feet high out behind the cabin. As our cabin is built near the crest of a hill, this observation deck, which we refer to as Star Porch, offers a 360 degree view of the desert around us, and a full, unobstructed view of the night sky. We sat together and sipped the violet-coloured tea my girlfriend made. It contained many flowers, was not caffeinated, and if she can remember the recipe, I will include it as a footnote. The flavour, and especially the aroma, had a strong and pleasant effect, which I could feel throughout my whole body. Simply smelling the tea produced painterly waves of fractals before my eyes. As the sky darkened fully, my partner expressed her desire to quit smoking cigarettes. She explained that she wanted to be free from the grip of addiction to them, and how she wanted to keep a relationship with smoking in the way one keeps a relationship with an old lover an occasional visit, an occasional reconnection. I told her she had my full support. Her desire to be free was almost tangible to me, and her analogy was beautiful and vivid in my mind. I could feel and see the force of life and will around her, like a warm light radiating from her center. She sat in silence while I admired her, and I began to feel something else. It was a sense of longing, or perhaps a sense of duty, but not one that I felt one that she felt. I could tell that she longed to nurture the young. I could see that she wanted a child. I considered the indecision and traumatic past surrounding my own fatherhood, and felt deeply sad that I didn't yet share in her yearning. As I looked on, I saw her in a way that was surreal and yet true. She took the form of a ruby, purple-coloured daffodil, glowing against the dark sky. Her head was a full and beautiful bloom, craning over and looking downward, as daffodil blooms tend to do. Before her on the deck of the porch, little daffodils were huddled together. Their blooming heads beamed up to her while she hung over them, as if she were singing a song or teaching a lesson which held them wrapped with attention. I began to cry for the beauty of what I saw, and I moved to hold her close to me. At this point, my self-image was that of a brilliant blue-winged humanoid creature, emanating a strong light and power of my own and she took a similar winged form to mine, still glowing with the ethereal purple light and warm radiance as before. It felt as though we had just landed on our perch there, and were looking out over the horizons around us, divining where next to fly. We laid down in our nest of blankets and held each other close. By now, my lover was also crying. I could feel our tears combining as our faces pressed together, while the light and beauty that shone out from each of us warmed me under the cold night sky. Suddenly, unexpectedly, in a way that two rain droplets may become one in a lucky breeze, our separate consciousnesses combined, and we became formless together. I was unbothered, even gleeful that this was happening, and it seemed that she was too. We identified and greeted each other wordlessly in this bright place, and we communicated ideas without speaking. It wasn't much like speaking at all, in fact, or at least it wasn't like speaking English. It was the most directly I've ever communicated with anyone. It was first like knowing for myself, 
and then like knowing that she knew too. The revelation here felt less about what we communicated, which was mostly messages of love and happiness for each other, and more in the manipulation of whatever dimensional fabric allowed this mode of communicating. It was an enrapturing, timeless, and exuberantly joyful experience. As is often the case during my mushroom trips these days, what I actually heard in my ears throughout the experience was primarily my material world tinnitus. Typically with psilocybin, it grows from its usual background ring into a chorus of high tones which hold a lifting note, almost like a thousand voices which never want for breath, but are always on the brink of running out of it. I feel it is not always present in my trips, but it's never unwelcome when it is. The physical sensation was that of being immersed in a warm and flowing, even bubbling liquid light, almost as though each of us were suspended in a solution of the other. What I saw once we had settled into being in our new dimension added immense depth to what I felt, and I can best describe it as beautiful, grotesque, and humbling. It was like a H.R. Giger painting, but warm, colourful, happy, loving, and encouraging. I saw the whole of connected consciousness extending outward from our place in it, like a galaxy of stars on a vibrant widow's web, rippling and undulating in all directions to infinite reaches and topographies. We flow together, like fluorescent, multicoloured blood through channels and veins, through parts of a body the likes of which I had never before seen, but somehow I observed with an easy acceptance, as though it was very obviously just the way things are. What I saw, in my own belief, was God, and our place within it at that time. Those here familiar with God may draw their own conclusions as to what form it truly takes. The image I experienced is still hanging in my mind's eye, which I cannot describe further with words. When we returned to our separate selves, after an unrecorded and unremembered amount of time in that plane of existence, we sat together, searching for ways to put it into words. As we compared what each of us had just experienced, we realised it all matched from the sensations to the visuals to the unspoken communication. The fact that I was able to see from an elevated perspective while merged with another person who can corroborate what happened constantly blows my mind. A psychic connection? A soul bond? Whatever it was, we both felt it was a glimpse into a greater truth beyond our perceived world. Coming from an early childhood of Sunday schools and youth groups to eventually becoming a high school atheist, I've long since my mid-twenties worked to develop a personal spirituality that is divorced from religion, and to find faith which lacks dogma, while still informing my sense of morality. It is through this experience that my years of seeking felt deeply rewarded, and at the time of writing, I still think about this daily. This peak behind the veil was moving for both me and my partner, unlike any vivid dream I've had, which tend to fade quickly if I don't write them down soon enough. This happened months ago, and this is the first time I'm putting it into writing. It was so real, I couldn't forget a single aspect of it. We decided the same night that though we wish to experience more of what we saw, we understand it may never come to us again, and we have to yet try to replicate the experience in any way we can. If it ever happens again, I will write of that here as well. I hope this report is somehow meaningful to others who are seeking. Psychedelics, even when taken unceremoniously, can change your life and the attitudes you take toward it. They can reveal and amplify what's inside of you, and what's all around you, even if you don't always see it yourself. Respect them and ingest them with love and care. Thanks for reading. So, he actually left the uh, ingredients for the tea. Oh my god, I'm going to butcher so many of these. Well, just one. Calendula, violet, rose petal, rose hip hibiscus, chamomile, and honey. Um, I'll feature them on the screen if you're watching. Now, what's interesting about this report is that we actually have a second one here, and this is covering his girlfriend's experience, so I'm just going to jump straight into that. Um, it's a really nice addendum to the uh, report. About an hour before sunset on October 18th, we took a large handful of mushrooms each. We'd both taken this particular batch, lovingly grown by a dear friend of my co-pilot, several times prior with consistently uplifting results, at a range of doses from single caps weighing less than 0.5 Gs to small handfuls weighing between 3 to 4. 
These are estimates, as I typically judge mushroom dosing based on intuition and their feel, occasionally documenting with a photo, rather than reliably measuring on a scale. On this occasion, we decided to take more, and I believe we took around 5 grams each. In my experience, a hallucinogenic dose of psilocybes results in a series of predictable physiological effects as the material begins to metabolise, in this case, after about 15 minutes. It starts with a mild nausea that is resolved by laying down supine and closing my eyes. There is a subtle physical sensation of blood rushing to my head, or my brain seeming to feel warm. Sometimes this is accompanied by chills, and it is very important for me to head that off because if I continue to feel cold, that can result in the nagging sensation of wetness anywhere my body is feeling chilly. Luckily, we live in the Mojave Desert. In mid-October, the highs were still in the 90s and the lows barely dropping below 70. So, as I lay down in my warm kitchen on the dinette bench, I felt a wave of strong drowsiness wash over me and waited patiently for the side effects of the come-up to subside. This stupor, however, was much more pronounced and long-lasting than those I experienced previously. When my partner checked on me after 15 minutes of laying there, I remember explaining that I felt sleepy and nauseous. I wasn't really uncomfortable, because I understood that I'd taken a higher dose than I'd possibly ever done in the last 15 years of using it, and I was accepting of the temporary state. Another 15 to 20 minutes went by, the sunlight was now disappearing, and I got up to urinate and immediately felt so drowsy it verged on dizziness. I remember telling my partner I felt weak as I left the bathroom. We'd taken this dose with the house to ourselves intentionally to have an evening of laughter, cuddling, and stargazing while our roommates were away. Two months prior, we'd started living together, and our relationship was blossoming into a more serious commitment. Both of us had looked forward to having an opportunity to share quality time together while our roommates were absent. As he caringly inquired into my status, I became aware that I wanted to proactively shake my side effects, and something struck me that I needed to make a tea. I set a pot of water to boil, and pulled every dried flower out of my herb drawer. Calendula, chamomile, rose petal, rosehip, violet, and hibiscus. In that moment, I noted a lack of thought process, and the feeling that I was operating on pure instinct, not recognising until the flowers hit the pot why my subconscious had motivated me to prepare the elixir in the first place. As I kind of smelt the terpene-laden vapours, I immediately felt more clear-headed, and the persistent nausea vanished. The liquid was a gorgeous violet colour, and felt excited that I had done some kind of kitchen witchery in an altered state. I would made a love potion for myself and my partner to enjoy for a romantic evening, simultaneously addressing the symptoms of onset, because I was ready for them to be over by now. Since I was feeling so much better, I gathered up a few items to take up to our star porch, a climbable shade structure in our backyard with a deck about 12 feet off the ground. We were accompanied by comfy pads, pillows, blankets, the pot of flower potion sweetened with honey, as well as water, seltzers, and a speaker. We climbed up, and for the next several hours we remained up there, literally pissing off the side of the thing rather than leave the stars in each other's company. As we settled in, I don't remember the details of our conversation, but I do remember a lot of laughter, swells of euphoria, and gratitude for my home, my lover, his dog, my cat, the desert around me and everything it has provided since moving there a year and a half prior. After an unknown amount of time, counting blessings, probably somewhere around an hour, I began to speak about my unhealthy dependence on cigarettes, and as I spoke, I realised how much I would like to embark on cessation efforts. This was the first time I ever brought up this insecurity with my partner, and as we sat together under the starry sky, I started to feel an omnidirectional expansion of my soul. A feeling of letting down a wall that had been overgrown in my mind to the extent that I forgot it was there. A state of pure emotional vulnerability in the safest possible place, in the arms of a person who was equally open to cradling my heart as it poured out my mouth. He heard my description of my desired freedom from addiction, and held me tighter and enthusiastically agreed that he wanted me to experience release from the chains of my toxic relationship with tobacco. As he grasped me, it seemed like I could feel every muscle fibre, every pump within a blood vessel, every electrical charge in his nervous system. You are such a beautiful person, he gasped, overcome as tears streamed down his face. I thanked him, eyes closed, and over the next few seconds, the sensory inputs of the material world were steamrolled by an all-encompassing spirit realm visualisation. 
spectacularly coloured undulating patterns that resembled fiddleheads and octopus tentacles unfurling. I was physically held tight into the chest of my partner, but that was secondary to the experience of being encased in an egg-shaped pink, white, golden yellow orb of safety and love. It was while in the egg that I knew for certain that he and I were fully communicating telepathically, and that he was having an equally immersive experience connecting directly to the soul. We both continued to hold each other close, and allow this moment of transcendence to play out as long as it possibly could, both of us occasionally muttering something like, wow, and gently crying with wonder. In the egg, I started to transmit psychic messages to other loved ones. We were situated in a dimension that made it impossible to account for the amount of time in the standard reality. Our mutual journey to the spirit realm slowly eroded, and I realized I was back in my body. We started to speak to each other out loud again, and even though I was certain that he was having the same experience as I was while we were having it, I was relieved and super excited when I started asking him about what he was seeing and telling him what I was seeing, and it really was as it felt in the moment. We had successfully soul melded. This was the peak effect of the mushrooms, but the trip was far from over. We continued to decompress, laugh, came down from the star porch to snuggle the dog and the cat, and finally lay down in bed, falling asleep as the sunlight returned. This was the most life-affirming experience I've ever had with another person, and the most potent out-of-body experience I have ever had, period. It's one of those situations that as much as I'd like to verbalise every detail, I feel like the language of love is poorly translated into English. Gotta say, probably one of my very favourite reports, to be honest. The mushroom reports always have this... Um, heartwarming sense of connection and love. You can get that on all psychedelics, but there's this magical, ethereal quality to mushrooms, I believe. Um, I can actually relate to this in a sense. Fully enough, I had this... Uh, LSD, the telepathy about... The first time I successfully soul melded, and it was with one of my mates. I've talked about this before uh, in my very first trip report, the brink of insanity. Uh, uh, unfortunately for me, everything went super fucking crazy after that uh, telepathy experience. I mean, it was the first ego death experience I'd ever had. It was a whole lifetime of atheistic, disconnected beliefs. There was so much separation and judgment in my mind and to have that all broken down in front of you and be like oh my fucking god this is god um can be quite <laughs> ptsd inducing when you resist it uh yeah i could have let go a bit further but we we roll i guess but yeah in that moment when um i sort of transcended my physical mind me and my mate noticed that we were talking to each other without moving our lips and I was in his mind, and I, he was in my mind. And then it went a bit further when we realised, no, we're, we're not in each of each other's minds. We've both become the same mind. Uh, that's a really hard thing to explain to anyone who's never experienced that. But for anyone who has, that you know what I'm on about. It, we went from duality to non-duality in a sense. We went from a dual state of... of uh, perception to a non-dual state of perception and the only way that was possible was in the it was the perfect moment of not just the psychedelics and the, the we had cannabis, smoking cannabis on the peak which I don't definitely don't encourage to be honest it's fucking it's like psychedelic russian roulette uh, just be really careful with that um but the the cherry on the cake um the the extra spice to the experience that really brought it all together into a cohesive package that allowed us to transcend dualistic thought was the emotions and the connection verbally that was going on before that and the, the laughter the love and uh, the self-reflection and so many so many elements going on energetically speaking that produced that what a beautiful experience that these two lovers had um really just just hammer home the connective property of psychedelics I'll tell you what um they do a lot of MDMA therapy, don't they, with uh, couples um, who are sort of losing the spark. Um, I think psychedelics are just as effective. Each of these chemicals that allow you to sort of transcend the self have different properties for you to work with. Um, 
Yeah, the, you, you can see how really effective these would be in a super progressive world where we're using these in a therapeutic uh, manner in, and we have wise, conscious um, uh, facilitators of the experience so that everything's safe and effective. But that's a whole new world, isn't it, that uh, maybe we're not ready for on a global scale. But it's inevitable. It's inevitable because... Yeah, consciousness is continuously evolving. You can resist it all you want, but it's going to happen anyway. So, yeah, thank you very much to a free lunch. Yeah, wouldn't mind a free free lunch myself, like. Uh, thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed this one. And if you, again, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, also, check out the Vivek Discord. If you would like to send a report in, don't send it to my email. Um... You just put it on the Vivek Discord and also make sure you structure it and, and, and use decent grammar because you've got a higher chance of me using that and the way this person and their girlfriend structured their report was awesome. Uh, brilliant writing as well. Um, really quite profound. Uh, you can write it in any way you want. Um, I don't really cherry pick them. Just got to be structured well um, and be engaging. Uh, yep. Yeah. I can't feature every report I get. I've got hundreds in my backlog. Unfortunately, they go back years. I'll never be able to feature them all, unfortunately. And that's just... That's just the way it is. So, yeah. No offense if I don't feature a report. But I'm always reading them. They always touch my soul. Regardless of whether I put them on the channel. So, just know that I've read every single one that I've ever got. And it's touched me. And inspired me further. So, even if you don't get on the channel, you're still doing bits for the channel. Uh, behind the scenes. Anyway... Sayonara, hasta la vista, adios, see you in a bit, our lad.